Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Fireside Chat. Today, we are going to finish our series on St. John the Apostle. And over the past three Fireside Chats, we've been discussing through the lens of Garagou Lagrange's work, our Savior and his love for us, the following question. How did Jesus, through his friendship with John, make John resemble him ever more closely? So we first looked at John resting on the heart, uh, near the heart of our Savior at the Last Supper. Yesterday, we looked at our Lord giving John Our Lady at the foot of the cross. And today, we're going to look at our Lord giving John a share of his cross. And through these three gifts, this is how John became more closely conformed to Christ through grace. So to make John's ministry fruitful, Jesus gave John a share in his cross and progressively made him understand his inestimable, in, his inestimable value. Jesus' friendship, there you go, notes, Jesus' friendship does not consist wholly in sweetness and joy. As strong as is it, it is as strong as it is tender. It tends to purify us through tribulations and through suffering to associate our souls with him in his own in the mystery of redemption so friendship with jesus is not just about warm and fuzzy feelings and feeling good friendship with christ is rooted in love and that love is ultimately going to draw me into the life of who I am, who is my, who is my beloved. And that drawing in by Christ through the grace of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to see that the mysteries of Jesus's life are also the mysteries of my life. So the apostles did not understand the friendship that Jesus offered them at first completely. When Jesus spoke of the foundation of the kingdom of God, the apostles wondered which of them would be first in the kingdom. And then Jesus would surprise them. We hear this from Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, where our Lord's, where it says, Jesus called a child over, placed it in his disciples' midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, Unless you turn and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven, our relationship with Christ, is not about dominance. It's not just about only getting what we want on our terms. It's rooted in divine love. It's rooted in the love that created us and the love that sustains us, that speaks to our hearts, but calls our hearts to something more. Garagou Lagrange also notes that Jesus said on several occasions the following to his disciples, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But when Jesus deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, the apostles didn't completely understand what this concept of cross meant. They could not un accept the idea that Jesus would be crucified. Yet several times throughout the Gospels before his betrayal and crucifixion and passion, he told them that this would happen. The Gospels note that one day, as he was going up to Jerusalem with them, our Lord again predicted his passion, crucifixion, and resurrection. And why did he do that? He wished to implant this reality more deeply into the mind of John and that of his brother James. At that moment, the mother of the two apostles, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, approached Jesus and bowed down to whisper something in his ear as if to ask him something. And we hear this in Matthew 20, verses 21 through 23, where 
Jesus says to her, what do you wish? And John, James's mother, answered him, command these two sons of mine sit, one at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus said in reply, you do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? They said to him, we can. He replied, my cup you will indeed drink, but to sit at my right and my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared by my father. So when Jesus said this, the cup you will indeed drink to, to both John and his brother James, this was the day that Jesus gave his cross to his beloved disciple. He gave him the reality of what the cross would meant. Garagou Lagrange notes the following. These words spoken by Jesus, like those spoken on the two other occasions, produce their effects in John's soul gradually over time. From that moment, John no longer sought to be the first. He no longer sought dominance or his own ego e to pursue things from an egotistical, prideful fashion. He began to love suffering and humiliation. And this love continued to grow in his heart through the influence of his grace. Over time, Jesus was to make John more and more like himself, just like he wants to do with us. And that is holiness, to become another Christ. John, Jesus came to suffer as the victim of salvation, to save us by his agony more than by his sermons. So he united John more and more to his toilsome and crucified life. The French writer Boissuet from the 18, uh, 1800s states, whenever Jesus comes, he brings with him his cross and his thorns, and he shares them with those who love him. Let me say that again. Whenever Jesus comes, he brings with him his cross and his thorns, and he shares them with those who love him. Why? It is through the cross that not only is the love of God, the Father and Christ the Son through the Spirit revealed to me, but I'm brought into that love, and that love transforms me. So as John was Jesus' beloved disciple, Jesus gave him the immense grace of a loving cross. John had at first thought that it's better to have an honored place in the kingdom of God. It was an, and that to have this honored place, it was necessary to be seated at his right hand and be clothed in glory. But John was to learn that we penetrate far into this kingdom, even here on earth, through suffering. He was to learn also how tribulation makes one clairvoyant in contemplating Jesus and the souls of men. When I unite my sufferings to Christ, when I unite my cross in the moment to his cross on Golgotha, then I'm able to see his presence through grace in those around me more clearly, especially in the poor, the suffering, the rejected, the neglected, the sick. Garagou Lagrange notes that affliction was to open the eyes of John and that he was to understand the profound meaning of the noblest of the Beatitudes, the one that is most astonishing to mere human reason. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for the sake of justice and righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This kingdom 
is already theirs here on earth, even in the midst of persecution, because of the profound peace that Jesus gives to those who suffer persecution for the sake of justice and righteousness. So what was John's cross, we must ask? Now, if we look at things outwardly, it may seem that this was the lightest, that his cross was the lightest of all the crosses given by Jesus to the apostles. John, along among all the apostles, didn't die in the throes of martyrdom. He did, of course, suffer persecution. Later in his life, as an old man in Rome under Domitian, the emperor, he was plunged into a cauldron of boiling oil. But even as he suffered through this horrific torture, he emerged refreshed and purified, purified in his heart. John was then exiled on the island of Patmos, where our Lord would appear to him towards the end of his life in glory. And our Lord would reveal his secrets to him, commanding him to write them down in the most mysterious of all the sacred books of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, the unveiling of God's plan of salvation. So viewed externally through mere human eyes, John's cross may seem to have been lighter than those of the other apostles. But as Basue says, Garagul Grange notes, St. John's cross was inwardly the greatest of all. Learn the mystery and consider the two crosses of our Savior. The one was seen on Calvary, and it seemed the more painful. The other is the one he carried all throughout his life, and it caused him far more suffering. Later in history, Jesus would explain to St. Catherine of Siena several times through his visions to her that this interior cross that he carried throughout his life was the desire for the salvation of souls, a desire that was combated by the spirit of evil, by the spirit of the world, and by the covetousness that sweeps millions of souls to perdition. In Jesus' life, we can follow the progress of the malice of those who hated him. This increased, this increased his thirst for the salvation of souls that was burning and consuming him. This martyrdom of the heart that Christ suffered is often more painful than outward martyr martyrdom, and it can last for years in merely, not merely only for a few hours. So that hunger for souls, that hunger to bring all to loving union with Christ, to loving union with him, and knowing that would be rejected caused Jesus immense suffering throughout his life, most especially in his agony of the garden and during his passion. And as Garagou points, that caused him even more internal suffering than the physical sufferings which he experienced, which were, were immense. It was particularly this interior cross of desire for the glory of God and for the salvation of souls that Jesus gave to St. John. It did not strike at the senses, but it was implanted by God in the depths of his soul, together with a very strong desire for the salvation of sinners. To make his apostle carrying, capable of carrying this interior cross, Jesus inspired in him the love of suffering which at once quickened the desire to a calm, steady flame and, presented, and prevented the soul from finding solace in anything outside of God. Likewise, when certain souls are called to holiness, find too much natural satisfaction in creatures, in the things of this world, in relationships, our Lord often will quickly pour a little bitterness on the satisfaction. That bitterness can be letdowns, various imperfections, 
not meeting our expectations. And this bitterness can far exceed the pleasure formerly enjoyed over time. But through this bitterness that we can experience, this can purify our hearts so that we not only so that we don't merely cling on to the things of this world, but we see how the things of this world point us to Christ and call us to our ultimate destiny, which is loving union with him, both in this world and in the next, and through him with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Finally, Garagou Lagrange notes, St. John's interior cross consisted most of all in the heresies that were mutilating Holy Mother Church in the years after most of the apostles had met martyrdom, which denied the divinity of Jesus. How these denials must have tortured the heart of the author of the fourth gospel, which was written to make known the word made flesh in all his glory. This interior cross derived from the division arising in the newborn church to the detriment of charity. When the apostle was about 80 years old, Garagou Lagrange notes, he would have his disciples carry him into the church of Ephesus. And since John could no longer preach long sermons, he would just say the following, my little children, love one another. He who is, who when in his youth, when he first began to follow Jesus, had been, had been called by our Lord, son of thunder. He was called this by Jesus because of his ardor. But now towards the end of his life, he can only speak of fraternal charity, the great sign of love of God. What does this mean though? Did John all of a sudden enter the church of Nice? Did he compromise himself? Did he compromise his faith or strength? No. Garagou Lagrange notes the following. John at this point had lost none of his armor or ardor or his hunger or th and thirst for justice, but it had become purified over time. So it became more spiritual and gentle. And when his listeners asked John why he was always repeating the same thing, he answered, that is the Lord's command. If you accomplish it, that is sufficient. This points to an important reality. When we become holy, when we become saints, as we are sanctified by the Lord, we don't lose our strength, but we know how to use our strength for his glory, for the honor and glory of God in a way that isn't just us loving him on our terms, but a way that he calls us to love him and to love others in his name. So as we grow in holiness, the saints, St. Saint Francis de Sales notes this, as well as many others, and Garagou Lagrange will note this also in the first volume of the Three Ages of the Interior Life, great spiritual classic. As we grow in holiness, the strong must become meek. What that means is this, we don't emasculate ourselves, we don't compromise who we are, but we know how to use our strength and use our identity in love for the glory of God. Likewise, the weak must become strong in Christ. That's beautiful. As we grow in holiness, the strong must become meek and the weak must become strong. And John embodied that throughout his life, especially in his letters towards the end of his life, where he keeps on repeating, God is love. Whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. In that, he shows an awareness of the ultimate purpose of the Christian life, his ultimate mission given to him by Christ as an apostle. And he points to what we are all ultimately called, to love, not in a hippie kind of way, love, 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 all you need is love. No, to 
give unto God by the power of his grace and to give unto our neighbor that peace, that happiness, that fulfillment, that perfection that the Father through Christ and the Spirit has made us for, not only in this life, but for all eternity in the life of the world to come. To do whatever it takes to help myself, to help others achieve that according to the will of God, according to his plan of love. Throughout our life, the Lord can give us interior crosses. And normally, Gary Lagrange notes, there are three kinds of crosses. First, there are those crosses that can remain useless, like that of the unfaithful thief. Then those, the unfaithful thief who was crucified next to our Lord and did not profess faith in him. Secondly, there are crosses that we carry to make reparation for our sins and to merit salvation, like that of the good thief who said to me, remember me, who said to Jesus, remember me, O Lord, when you come into your kingdom as he was crucified next to him. And then finally, there are crosses that make us think of our Savior's cross and that we are called to bear in order to labor with him for the salvation of souls. When we carry a cross well, it in turn carries us. A cross can be a lonely place. But if we look at the reality of the cross, yes, we can say with our Lord, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But he says that from the depths of his suffering, amidst, and it leads to praise, to trust, to surrender. So the cross can unseal our eyes and lead us toward contemplation, lead us towards love, and help us to see God hidden in the souls of men and the day-to-day -day grind that we face in life. If such a cross sometimes seems very heavy, we ought to ask our Lord Jesus to give us the grace to embrace it with his heart to embrace this suffering with the love of his own sacred heart and also to help guide and direct us, show us the way amidst this path, path of suffering we may have to experience. This is what Jesus desires since he has given us his heart, a wounded heart. He has also given us his mother and one of the greatest graces that Our Lady of Sorrows can obtain for us is the grace of delighting and the crosses that are that the Lord places in our on our shoulders to purify us and to enable us to labor for the salvation of souls. This is truly to enter into Christ's intimacy and to participate in his hidden sorrowful life before having a part in his glorious life of heaven. So we pray to St. John today that through his intercession, the intercession of Our Lady, that we may be given the grace from Jesus to carry our cross faithfully with trust and surrender, and to let that cross, no matter how heavy it may be, uplift us, purify us, stretch us, so that we may love with the heart of Christ, not only for the glory of God the Father, but those around us, to love with the heart of Christ, those people and those situations we find most difficult and unbearable so that we may lead others and we may enter into ourselves that loving intimacy that Christ wishes to give us with him, not only in this life, but for all eternity in heaven. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. You have a good day.